I did it. I finally shot the son of a bitch. Betty? Betty, where are you right now? I don't know. Betty, are you all right? What are you saying, Mom? I can I can barely understand. Mom, Mom, just just no, no, come over here. Just get over here as soon as we'll talk. We'll, I don't know. Can you come here, Mom? Hello? No, it's Tommy. Yeah, hold on. Jerry, it's Miss George. Tell her your mom is out. She wants to speak to you. Hey, Karen. Uh, Brendan Cross lives down the street. I'll go get him. We'll go see if, if it's true. Is it out there? Oh, uh, well, uh, maybe she just. Have you called your father's to find out if he. Okay, honey, take it easy. Let me call Kevin McDonald, see what he can find out. Uh, where's your mother now? Kate, be careful. I know she's your mother, but if this is true, just. Be careful. Hi, Dad. I know it has. Too long. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I just, time goes by, you know. Anyway, is Mother there? Oh. The kids are fine. Look, I just want, yeah, I'm fine. No, I'm not. Dan says we're driving me crazy. <laughs> Things are worse than ever. I, I feel like committing suicide. I just feel so awful. I just, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think I can talk anymore right now. Um, tell mother, I called. Larry Broderick. I'm calling from Colorado trying to reach my brother Dan. Who am I speaking with? This is Detective John Sorrell. Can I help you? My niece just phoned me to tell me that her mother claims to have shot Dan and Linda Broderick. Is this true? Well, I'm afraid I can't tell you about that. Look, please, just tell me if they're alive or not. Please. Well, I can't. I have no way of knowing if you really are who you say you are. Okay, uh, uh, okay, look. Uh, what phone are you on? What room? 
Uh, front hall. All right. Look on the table behind the phone. There's a ceramic plate. Read the inscription. If you're lucky enough to be Irish, you're lucky enough. Love, Larry. I'm Larry. Please tell me. I'm sorry, Mr. Broderick. They are both dead. I don't know. I don't know what to do next. You know, I, I, what do I do? I don't know how this happened. You know, I really don't. Here, let's tea. Drink some. Thank you, girls. I. Uh, I'm really sorry if I ruined your day. I, I hope you didn't have anything special planned, did you? Mom, you have to turn yourself in. Mom, will you listen to me? Lighten up, okay? Mom, we'll go with you. You don't have to be alone, I promise. We'll be there. Okay, bye-bye. Well, my lawyer is out of town, but his partner will meet us at 4 o'clock. He'll take you to the police station. Okay. Uh, okay, Debbie, can you go back to my house and get my uh, file box? Sure. Okay, Karen, can you witness that? Sure. What is it? It's a makeshift will, but it's legal. You know, I just want to make sure that if anything happens, get what's mine. Kate, here is a check for $10,000. I want you to cash it and divide it equally among all of your children. They're going to take this from me anyway. Just hold on to him, okay? My name is Carrie Steinberg. This is my client, Elizabeth Broderick. We have reason to believe she's a suspect in a case you have opened. She's turning herself in on those grounds, and we have nothing further to say at this time.
under your bed. You can't wear them to school. Now, I put your Ninja Turtle socks and your high tops next to your closet. What would I want with your stupid flip-flops anyway? Dad, am my flip-flops stupid? Absolutely not. Todd, ah, where is your sweatshirt? I laid it out for you. I don't need a sweatshirt, Mom. No, it's supposed to get chilly later. I can't find my shoes! Get by your closet! Hey! Guess who just turned herself in for fatally shooting her ex-husband and his new wife? Where? Uh, by the skateboard! Can I wear my jacket instead? Yes! <laughs> who? The highly publicized divorce saga came to a tragic end early yesterday when both Broderick and his new wife were killed. Many women in women's groups have rallied around Elizabeth Broderick in her lengthy struggle against the former San Diego bar president. Mrs. Broderick has continually claimed that her ex-husband's influence made it impossible for her to gain a fair settlement. Good morning. Good morning. Have you heard about what happened to Dan Broderick? It's all over the radio. Exactly. She's very good at getting public attention. You want it? Thank you. Have you seen a police report yet? Just came from there. She snuck into the bedroom at 5 a.m. and pumped three shots into them while they slept. Sounds like a murder to me. Me too. Now all you have to do is prove it. As if 16 years together had never existed? To simply walk away and, and leave any sense of human communication to your lawyer? To your lawyer? It's, it's like he's saying to me that I'm, I'm hardly even worth talking to. Like I was less than human. Did you feel less than human? I felt alone. Terribly, terribly alone. He took our kids, our friends, our life. And nobody helped me fight to get him back. I mean, I, I was forced to stand up for myself. And you know, in the final analysis, the only person my kids and I could ever count on was me. Brendan and Ann last night. Ann took them all over the aquarium trying. I don't know. Give him something. Anything else to think about. We'll take them over to my house. Appreciate your taking them in, Kevin. Hey. Dan would have done anything for me. He's the greatest. He's the greatest friend you could ever have. She killed her children's father. Her own children's father. Look, Tommy and Brent need their stuff, their clothes and things. They're all over Dan and Linda's. Larry? We've, uh, we've got to discuss a funeral arrangement. Six months ago, we were discussing their wedding. Hello. There's a Larry Broderick on line three for you. I'll take it in here. Hello, Mr. Broderick. Actually, I was going to call you today. I'm very sorry about your brother. Thank you. Uh, I need to ask you a favor. OK. Well, I'm here in San Diego, and the boys, Tommy and Grant, dance sons. I know. Right, well, they're staying with family and friends, and they don't have any of their things, you know, their personal stuff. Anyway, I just went over to dance to try to get him some things, and uh, the cops have the place sealed off. It's still a crime scene. Yeah, I know. So, uh, I was wondering if you wouldn't mind going over there yourself. 
I can do that for you. Thanks. I'll call you back later. Goodbye. Goodbye. Miss Wells, she brought you some things. Thanks. Carrie, do you know Kevin McDonald? Oh. Hi, Kevin. Carrie Wells. I wanted my Chargers t-shirt. Well, I think I packed it. Oh, here. Wow, thanks. <laughs> my dad and I went to see him last year. Do you guys mind if I talk to you a few minutes? Uh-uh. Uh-uh, no. Why don't we leave you all alone for a while? Is that okay with you? Yeah. I'm the district attorney. You'll be trying the case against Mom, right? Right. I know this is real hard for both of you. Real hard. But I have to try and find out the truth. Can you help? Yeah. Okay. So, were you surprised with what happened? I mean, the shooting? Mm -mm. How come? She was always telling us she's gonna. She said some pretty bad stuff about him and Linda. There's some bad words. Like what? Well, they're kind of embarrassing to say. Miss Wills, will my mom be out in time to see my soccer game? Those kids mean everything to me. Do you understand? Those kids mean everything to me. Everything. And, and they've been away from me for so long now, they've got to grant me some kind of bail. The kids need me. I, I need them. I do understand, and I'll make the judge understand. I promise. I'm sorry, but it's hard for me to trust lawyers. I mean, Dan could manipulate the system so well. He was the best. I've already had to fire one incompetent lawyer. My name is Maggie Colquina Seats, and Linda Broderick was my sister. Linda was loved by so many people for so many different reasons. She was funny. She was thoughtful, she was compassionate, and she celebrated life. I would like you all to close your eyes for a moment and think about the last time you saw Linda. I bet she was smiling. Kids, your father was devoted to you. He persevered with you and for you under unimaginable circumstances. And because of these bizarre circumstances, which were not his doing, it may be years before you're old enough to fully understand the depth of your father's feeling for you. And that he truly loved you. from beginning to end. Your Honor, we're not talking about a flight risk here. All she wants to do is care for her children. Your Honor, Mrs. Broderick has violated every restraining order and every injunction that has ever been put into effect. 
She has demonstrated on each one of those occasions that she has absolutely no respect for the law. The public has a right to be protected from her. I can think of no reason why she would flee or harm anyone else. I can. She killed two people. Enough. Mr. Bird, you are not defending a traffic violator here. Ms. Wells, the people will get their chance to try Mrs. Broderick at a later date. This is a bail hearing. Anything else? After considering everything each of you has said this morning, I cannot in any kind of conscience release Mrs. Broderick on bail. The crimes, whatever they turn out to be, are heinous. I'm afraid she's going to have to remain in custody. Thank you all. I'd rather have her be my lawyer. I need your help. I'm all alone in here. Dan's gone, but his influence isn't, that's for sure. Yeah, I, I get these kids out of law school, and the state gets Carrie Wells. I mean, that gal's sharp as hell. So I need to find a way to get my story, the, the real story, out to the press, and consequently to the public at large. Mrs. Broderick. Betty, please. Betty, your case is very compelling to me. Very. Thank you. See, I, I realize that public relations can be a very powerful tool, especially when it's handled by a firm as respected as yours. So maybe you can finally be the weapon that I've never had. Good. Maybe we can change your luck. Great. <laughs> I have been stepped on so many times I should have welcome printed across my forehead. <laughs> I put the divorce records you wanted on your desk. Oh, thanks, Jim. Mrs. Broderick's a real piece of work. <laughs> Tell me about it. Seen today's paper? I still haven't had a minute to. Get out of here. A public relations firm? I mean, a PR firm? What is she, a movie star? Maybe we should put in for a change of venue. <sighs> to where? Hollywood. He always denied he was sleeping with her while we were still married. I think that's what hurt so much. He, he couldn't be honest enough to admit it, even years later when everybody knew. He always insisted it was my imagination, you know? That I was crazy. When did you last see your children? Just before I checked in here. This used to always be my favorite time of year. Right about now, we'd just be getting back from the USC game at Notre Dame. Then a major Thanksgiving fest at our house. It's a real big to do. I loved it. You know, all the activity and the excitement. Dan took Linda with him the last couple of years to the game. She just stepped into my life. So while you were pregnant for the first time, you continued working? Yeah, but in those days, you had to cover it up. I mean, I was teaching third grade. I was a source of the family income. I worked right up to the day Kate was born. We needed the money. And that way, Dan could be the full-time student he needed to be. And you told me you lost the baby, right? Yeah, it would have been our third child. It was a very, very bad pregnancy. I bled a lot, and I was sick the whole time, but I kept working. Well, how soon after the birth did the baby die? Two days. Unfortunately, Dan wasn't there. He was off skiing with a bunch of his friends. I was all alone. I'll tell you, a woman alone is a woman without a prayer. You ought to see this. From Betty Broderick to me. She feels she's getting inadequate representation. You can't get a fair trial. So she's considering representing herself. Well, she knows the legal system. I'll give her that. Might even get her a little sympathy from a jury, too. Woman alone against all odds. And proof positive she can't get a lawyer in this town. Come on, there's got to be someone in San Diego she can live with. Doesn't there? 
and I promise you that Betty Broderick will finally have her day in court. Now, after my review of just some of the documentation in this case, I'm convinced that she will be vindicated. Mr. Early, what do you think the defense will be specifically? Well, it was too early to tell you that. But I will tell you this. We're dealing with a woman here who has suffered abuse of the most violent kind at the hands of her ex-husband for well over 20 years. I've got to go. Thank you. Just one more Mr. Mr. Early, what kind of documentation? I went to a marriage encounter run by the Catholic Church in 1979 to talk about what we want in life and out of our marriage. <laughs> Dan apologized profusely. He said he knew he wasn't the kind of father and husband that he wanted to be and that I deserved. <laughs> yeah, he knew it was a problem, but he had these goals in life. So he wanted to be a very important man. Want a big house. Want to be very prominent, very rich. He wrote about it all in the Marriage Encounter Journal. He said that when he accomplished that, then he could attend to being a better father and husband. Did it ever happen? Oh, yeah. Not with me. With her. They were even planning a family. You know, it's like he, he turned in me for a, a younger model and then made sure I never recovered. You know, it's almost like he, he forced me to do what I did. Betty, do you see the implications? Of what? Your actions. My kids and I suffered a lot for a very, very long time. And we didn't want it. We didn't ask for it. And I really don't think we deserved it. But we suffered just the same. Hotter. Get out. I'm telling you, I can't attend an affair without someone bringing your name up. And I'm talking about the hairdressers, the tennis club. Betty, I, I was online in the supermarket. Oh, you gotta be kidding! On the checkout line, two women arguing your case. They didn't know me. They didn't know we were friends. It's just on everyone's mind. You've altered some female consciousness. I'll tell you that. Everybody's saying, <laughs> be nice to your ex-wife, Wink. <laughs> Are you? I mean, uh, in here. It's it's the most humiliating experience of my life. I'm sorry. Listen, um, you need anything? Sleep. I don't think I've had a, a good night's sleep. Five years. Boozy graveside ceremony. Emotional terrorism. Victim of this, victim of that. My God, my brother and his wife are dead, and she pulled the trigger, but she's being portrayed as some kind of feminist folk heroine. It's ludicrous. I can't control the media. You're controlling us. What about our story? We were there. We saw the way she harassed my brother and her own kids for the past five years. Maggie could tell the press a few stories and make a stone weep. When does our side get to be heard? In court. Great. In the meantime, she'll be canonized. Look, it's my responsibility to convict her in a court of law. It's 12 jurors we have to convince, not the press. Do you understand? Look at this one. Wow. <laughs> it's from New Zealand, <laughs> Philippines, this is New Jersey, all over the place. Broderick! We're gonna come out of the woodwork to say, go for it, Hey, baby. Broderick, let's go! <laughs> Do you mind federal losses? I'm allowed my time in the sun. Next. Your lawyer's on the phone. I am. I should say so to begin with. That one? Oh, one of you all take me to this every day. Just chatting away. Thank you.
3933. Where's your wristband? I don't have one. You were issued one. Where is it? You're the only deputy that ever asked for it. Where is it? Uh, ripped. I'll get you a new one. I don't need one. Every deputy in this hellhole knows who I am. I get more than 200 letters a week. I don't need a wristband. I need a secretary. I'll get you a new wristband. Hey, Jack! And you will wear it. So, when do we start? Well, Mr. Early has finally been forced to agree on a judge, so jury selection begins in two weeks. When will you need the boys? Don't know yet. Listen, I want to speak to them one at a time. Okay. Come on. Okay. We like Linda a lot, so we wanted to live there. But I thought if Grant and I went over to Mom, she wouldn't be mad all the time and everything would be fine. It seemed like towards the end, she just wanted money more than anything. Towards the last year or so. It's my fault. I knew she had a gun. She said she was gonna kill Dan and Linda. She always kept it in her pocket when he came to get us. One time, he was on his way over and she said she was gonna shoot him when he got there. I begged her not to, but she wouldn't listen. And then Dad honked the horn, and I, I just, like, ran out. And we drove away. And I looked back, and I saw Mom standing on the porch. She was smiling at me, waving. The gun? I should have stolen it or, or thrown it away or something. I should have. Tommy. Believe me, there's no way you could have done anything to stop your mom from doing what she did. The bus stop, the bus stop. Oh, welcome back. I'm not going to put the boys on the stand. They know things, saw things, that could help us out a lot, but they are too devastated. And if their mother is true to form and causes some kind of a scene at the trial with them, they may never recover from all of this as it is, but at least maybe they've got a chance. I'm just afraid to subject them to any more torment over this. You know? Your call. And your instincts. And my butt, right? So what'd you bring me? Well, I figured to start out with that black suit. No black. It's too depressing. It's too tight. Okay, well, that's what I thought. So I brought the navy dress. You know, it has a little fuller cut. <laughs> And also that taupe with a pleated skirt. The Navy has a pleated skirt. Oh, no, the Navy's straight. Have I been in this hole so long I don't remember my own wardrobe? <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Maybe dressing like a human being again will make me feel like one. Everything's just been pressed, and I told them to handle it with kid gloves. Well, with these jokers, it's like trying to tell a puppy not to pee on the rug. <laughs> I gotta go. Okay. See you in court. Get a ringside seat. Mm -hmm.
This case, to put it in the simplest terms possible, is about hate, revenge, and murder. It is about Elizabeth Broderick, a woman who for the past few years has systematically, continually, and vengefully tormented and harassed her ex-husband Dan and his wife Linda. Her hatred knew no bounds. Sometime near the end of October 1989, she said to Dan's housekeeper that she wanted to make Dan and Linda's lives as miserable as she possibly could. Referring to Dan, she said, I'll either make his life a living hell or I'm going to kill him. When Elizabeth Biseglia married Dan Broderick back in 1969, she believed in the concept of family of teamwork. Now, when they started out together, they literally had nothing. Dan was a student, and Betty worked. And over the next 10 or 12 years, through, through nine difficult pregnancies and four births, Betty continued to work to support her husband's pursuits, all in the name of teamwork. But by doing that, Betty Broderick made a mistake. Because not only was she sacrificing her own comfort, but she was losing a sense of herself. She became totally defined by, she totally identified with the marriage. Lo and behold, one day Dan Broderick, who by this time was a, a wealthy, powerful attorney, decided to abandon his wife. Why? He had an affair. So he left. Oh, and, and when he left, he took a few things with him. He took their dreams. He took their children. Their money. He took their life. And by doing that, Dan turned Betty Broderick, his loyal wife for 16 years, he turned her from this into this. There were occasions where he would hire security? Yes. He used to ask me and my sister how Mom was doing. Was she okay? And we'd be the only ones to let him know if he should get an armed guard in front of the house when we thought Mom was in a bad mood. What did they call her? Fat. Disgusting. The beast. The monster on a warpath. And, and this was in front of your little brothers that they would do this? Yes, it was. Would you say that you and Elizabeth Broderick were close? Yes. Betty and I saw a lot of each other. Spent a lot of time together until... Um, shortly before the tragedy. What was the defendant's attitude about money? I'd say she worshipped it. Betty is a very materialistic person. She always has been. She did a lot of buying, spending? Yes. Whenever anything went wrong, she'd spend. She had uh, catalogs from back east that she could call early in the morning and order stuff on her credit cards. Was this during the same time she would complain to you she had no money? Sometimes. Uh, she complained that she could hardly make ends meet, and then the next week she'd show me something she bought. It seemed inconsistent, seems but <sighs> that was Betty, you know. How would you describe the defendant? What type of person? Tremendously energetic. <laughs> Just about the perfect mother. Was she someone who appeared to be only interested in spending lots of money on clothes and such? No. No, not at all that way. 
Did you have an opportunity to visit the house that she moved into in La Jolla after her separation from Dan? Yes. Can you describe for us how that house was furnished? Uh, um, at first, almost like a, a newly married person would do it. No real furniture. Certainly not what I saw at the Coral Reef house when she and Dan were married. Do you know how she was sleeping? Uh, just on a mattress in a box spring. Not even a bed frame. Hi, we're back. I'm Laura Schlesinger, and we're talking about Betty Broderick. Now, she killed her ex-husband and his new wife because she said she was battered and abandoned. But there are many with a different opinion, and I want to hear yours. What do you think? Okay, we've got Peter on the line from Coronado. Go ahead, please. Hi, uh, Laura. Hi, Peter. Uh, You're on. Just a second. Let me turn the radio down. You know, about this Broderick thing, I, I, something like that happened to me uh, last year. Your ex-wife shot you? Well, no. I, we went through a really bad divorce and everything. Uh -huh. and, you know, I, I, I think this uh, Betty Broderick's getting a bad deal. How do you say that? Well, I mean, you know, she worked hard. She, she put her husband through school and... And, uh, he's a, and he dumped her for this, this, this bimbo secretary. And well, wait a minute, wait a minute. He makes you... a lot of money. He doesn't want to pay he, any child support. He owed her the rest of his life? Well, you know, she's got to stand up for, for herself, you know. These are extenuating circumstances. Stand Do you recognize these keys? They're mine. And how did you lose them? My mom was dropping me off at my apartment after work one day, and... I walked up to my door and my keys were gone. I asked her if she'd seen them and she said no. We even searched her car for them. She helped you look for them? Uh-huh. And then we went back to her house and looked. Did you find them? No. Did you ever after that come to know where they were? No, well, yeah, after. After it was too late. So then, not before November 5th? No. You ever lose them before? No. They were kind of a big deal to my dad. We were supposed to guard our keys to his house, like with our lives. He didn't want Mom to have them. A classic situation. The husband's denial of the affair only compounds the damage and trauma he's already caused the wife. And how would that make her feel, the wife? Oh, she'd feel a tremendous amount of resentment, hurt, and, of course, anger. Doctor, in your opinion, do you think that the legal war that Dan Broderick waged against his wife in divorce court... Objection, Your Honor. The witness has no first-hand knowledge. He never even met Dan Broderick. Sustained. In your opinion, as a family counselor of how many years did you say? Fifteen. Right. Looking at Mrs. Broderick and the supporting data, would you say that Dan Broderick was a wife batterer? Well, my expertise is domestic violence. And based on what Mrs. Broderick has told me, she was physically, sexually, and psychologically abused by Mr. Broderick. Is this a check Dan wrote for your leased car for $398? It was really his car that he allowed me to use. Is this a check for $2,000 cash made out to you on March 15th from Dan? Yes. And do we have here $445 to iMagnons, $550 to Saks, Neiman Marcus? Do you shop at all those stores? I shop everywhere. What about $3,000 to American Express? That's when the kids were living with me. That was for the kids. So Dan was paying the children's expenses then? He was paying the bills, yes. Could you identify this? The check made out to me. From? Dan. For how much? $3,000. Did you write this little note at the bottom, thanks, sweetie? Yes. Okay. 
This is a $9,000 check made payable to you. Is this part of the system of monthly payments that Dan set up for you? I guess so. Uh-huh. Lights, please. Now, it was during this period of time you started vandalizing his home, didn't you? Yes. Okay. So, in addition to paying all the clothing and car leasing bills, in addition to paying you $9,000 a month, and in addition to purchasing for you a $650,000 ocean view estate in La Jolla, Dan was also paying home insurance, taxes, medical insurance, car insurance, and income taxes while you continued to vandalize his home. Is that correct? Right. Right. Miss Broderick, can you remember the first year that there was money from Dan's business, where money was no longer a problem? The first year we could actually um, meet our bills and go on trips was 1982. And he started buying me fur jackets and jewelry and stuff. How did that feel? Oh, we were celebrating. Both of us, literally, <laughs> celebrating. And did you end up going to Europe at any time? Uh, yes. Um, another lawyer had referred a case to Dan that turned out to make us a lot of money. So to say thank you, Dan thought we should take the lawyer and his wife with us to Europe for three weeks. So we did. <laughs> you know, five-star hotels and restaurants, everything, all on Dan. During that period of time, did Dan's demeanor, his attitude, change in any way? Dan was always under a lot of pressure, um, mostly self-imposed. So when we went to Europe and he was unusually quiet, not mirth-filled as he was on vacations, um, I attributed it to pressure, though I did think it was a bit odd. Now, when you all got back home, did Dan's demeanor, his, the way he talked about you, the way he talked to you, did that change at all? We were in a car on the way to uh, a very important wedding. And all of a sudden, he started telling me that he just wasn't happy with anything. Not the children, or the cars, or the house, our social life, our friends, me. You. What did he tell you about yourself? He said it was my fault because I was old, fat, boring, ugly, and stupid. He just wasn't having any fun anymore. Well, what, what were you like back then? I was 35. I, I wore a size eight, which for someone my height can, can hardly be called fat. So what did you do? If your husband is telling you that, that you don't please him anymore, then you try to do whatever it is better. So I, I tried to be better. I lost weight. Um, I let my hair grow long the way it was when I was in college. I, I tried to get rid of wrinkles that weren't even there. There was a tiny little millimeter of a crack in a tooth. I fixed that. I tried to be perfect, absolutely flawlessly perfect for Dan Broderick. Well, they've been deliberating for six days, for God's sakes. What could they possibly be arguing about? Jerry, if I have to spend one more day in this dungeon, I'm just going to... Oh, I mean, the place makes me sick. The other day, one of, one of my goon deputies ransacked my room while I was in court. Threw everything all over the place, you know? What was she looking for? I asked to talk to the captain, the, the, the lieutenant, the sergeant. I, I was refused. It's not right. I don't know. It's just not right.
Have you, ladies and gentlemen, reached a verdict? We have not, Your Honor. We are unable to come to a unanimous decision at this time. Have you discussed every possible option? We have, Your Honor. I'm very sorry. So am I. Has there been a consensus as to whether further deliberation might break the deadlock? Uh, there has, Your Honor, and we unanimously feel that it would not help. This is good. Then I have no choice but to declare a mistrial. Oh! <laughs> Quiet, please. I thank you for your efforts. I know you worked very hard. Meantime, counselors, I'll set a new arraignment for two weeks hence, at which time we will schedule another trial. Court's adjourned. Mr. Strong, is it true, sir, that the vote was 10 to 2, but that you were the main holdout on the jury? Sure it is, and I'm proud of it. Can you oh, say that overriding thing in Mr. Broderick's favor, as far as you're concerned? There was no one thing in particular. Well, can you tell us if you think she was justified in shooting Dan and Linda Broderick? No. But I can't tell you this much. I don't know what took her so long. So do you think that that I just don't know if I want to disrupt my life for another whole year. And last time really consumed me. My kids are a year older. I feel 10 years older. I can't recall ever getting so personally involved. And I know that can't be good. Well, you put on a fine case. Who could ever predict a jury? <laughs> You going to communion services today? Sunday, isn't it? Take your religious materials. I don't need them. Hands and waistband, Broderick. Broderick, I said hands and waistband. Then she forgotten. I have not been found guilty of anything. I had a jury eating out of my hand. As you know, prisoners are required to walk with their hands in their waistband. Halt! What do you want from me? I want you to follow the procedures like everybody else in this place does. You really get off on this authority bull, don't you? I haven't interviewed Betty myself yet, just gathering opinions and such at this point. Well, I think what Betty did was courageous. Care to elaborate? She had to do it to get attention. No one would listen otherwise. Betty has done something real important for scores of women in this country. And now that 2020 and People magazine have contacted her about future interviews, and, and with your magazine publishing your story, that's national exposure. Which means that maybe the next Dan Broderick will think twice. I imagine he will. Look, I, I, I know it was extreme, but sometimes you need a little prairie justice. Steve? What? I've decided to take a second trial. I think that's great. You don't? Mm -hmm. You think it will be another year of hell? Oh, you mean it won't? <laughs> of course it will. But if I don't take it, it's like, it's like she's won. I keep thinking of all the time I've spent trying to protect real battered and abused women, I mean, the, the ones whose husbands won't leave, the women who have no choices. 
And then I think about Betty Broderick. There is not one shred of evidence that he ever laid a finger on her. She's a fraud. And I can't just walk away. Natalie Parker? Hi, Betty. Hi. Oh, I didn't know you were coming, or I would have fixed my hair. <laughs> oh, well, it's, it's OK, really. Oh. Hi. Hi. Um, so where do we start? Well, I'd like to ask you what you think about the fact that some people are applauding your courage and bravery. Some people think I'm a feminist, but I'm no feminist. You know, I had my house and my sandbox and my swing set. I was the ultimate suburban housewife. I loved it. I, I had exactly what I wanted until the nightmare began. The legal battle? Battle? It's a massacre. I didn't stand a chance. I was, I was an opponent. He buried me in legal papers, filled, filled an entire room in my house, written in this legal mumbo jumbo, most of which is Chinese to me like his famous bifurcation order. Meaning? A bifurcation order is a way of obtaining a legal divorce without having to settle the property and custody and alimony issues. I call it a bifornication order. <laughs> it's a way of legally screwing your wife and your girlfriend at the same time. <laughs> Karen George says there are times when women need to take the law into their own hands. What do you think? You know I can't answer that. You know what the answer is. Thank you, All set. Reservations for 12.30. What's up? I just got a call from Jack early. He wants to make a deal. He's willing to bargain a 20-year prison term for Betty. In exchange for what? We dropped the murder charge. What do we call what she did to the deceased? Criminal mischief? They'll accept voluntary manslaughter. Look, I think we've got to ask ourselves uh, what we're after in the long run. If it's to get her off the street, then we have to consider his offer. I want to put her away. And if I don't convince a jury this time around and end up deadlocked again, she could walk, which would be a real tragedy. Well, 20 years with good conduct. <sighs> uh, for argument's sake, we're looking at a scenario where she's out in 10. Still, my problem is the message. We are saying to the world, it's OK. It isn't murder. And that scares me a lot. More than if she walks? Carrie, Jack Early is returning your call. OK, Barbara, put him through. Yeah, Jack, I'm here. So, are we bargaining this thing or not? I'm afraid not, Jack. We'll see you in court. Okay, so you'll come back, right? You shoved down and falling off the bench. Lose some weight. Shove down. Shove down. <laughs> You can let her get away with that? Yep, she is. Ain't no TV around here now. Today, you just another sad ass, locked up bitch. Like us. Oh, nothing like you. Yeah. Oh! 
Okay, you two, that's enough. You two? Are you blind? You're just stupid. Relax, Broderick. Relax. How am I supposed to relax? You wouldn't chain a dog like this. Bus boarding. Let's go. I need help now. I'm gonna write you up for that, Broderick. Maybe a couple of days in lockdown. Remind you where you are. How could I forget? You best start behaving your button here. Could become home sweet home for permanent. I heard that hung jury head can against you. Almost too close for comfort, ain't it? Oh. We got her psychiatric records. Oh, nice work. Uh, what are you hoping to find? I'm not sure. Just that she must have said some things to those psychiatrists that she's twisted around since. If I know what they are, I can impeach her testimony. Uh, how soon can you have access? I'm on my way to Jack Early's office now. Hey, guys. We're going to move Betty. from yesterday earned you two days in lockdown starting now. Come on. No, they told me. We gave you verbal and written notice. Now get off the bunk and let's hustle it up. I'm not going. No, just stick your hands off me. OK, we're going to do this the hard way. Let's go. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Get out of here. Watch out. I got it. You don't. You don't. Oh. 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 Tragically wrong. A vicious divorce. Dan married his beautiful young assistant, and Betty got a gun. Did she murder in cold blood? Did he drive her to it? Don Hubble has the exclusive interview. Watch America Reports Friday at 10. I'm just so confused. I mean, I know my mom's a criminal, a murderer. And there are times I lie there and I still can't believe my dad's gone. But then sometimes I think, you know, what the hell am I doing? A testifying against my own mother? My sister's barely speaking to me. I'm sorry about that. And my mom thinks you're a traitor. Worse. After the first trial, she told me that I was a marked woman. What am I now, on her hit list? Kate, look. Your mom's not well. She's not insane under the legal definition, but she definitely has been out of control for a long time. If we could get a conviction and some professional help for her while she's in prison, maybe she'd finally come to some kind of terms with what she's done. Meantime, you have to move on with your own life and not worry about being on anyone's hit list. Yeah, I know. I know. I 
heard that Court TV is going to be there this time. I don't want to testify in front of them. You know, it's too much. It's like the whole world, all your friends, strangers, they're all watching you when you're the most vulnerable. I mean, it's everywhere. Prime time, magazines, it just keeps growing. I'll talk to Judge Whalen. See if I can get the cameras barred. You have to. And if I can't. I'll do what I have to do. Elizabeth Broderick wants very badly to be viewed in this case, not as the killer, but as the victim. Unfortunately for her, the evidence will show that she distorted and exaggerated the events to such a degree that even her own children recognize it. So before even one witness takes the stand, I want to take every pertinent detail of this case and give you Elizabeth Broderick's version, then contrast it with fact. So what he really did when he left that day, when he walked out on this woman who held his marriage together all those years, what Dan Broderick really did to his family was to smash it. And shatter their dreams. Well, it worked the first time. There is no better reason for someone to kill than to protect their home, possessions, and family from attack and destruction. You have attacked and destroyed me, my home, my possessions, and my family. A law degree does not give you immunity from punishment. No one will mourn you. Your mother wrote that in her diary, is that correct? Yes. Was your father attacking and destroying you and your possessions and your family? No. Was he attacking and destroying your mother's possessions or person? No. How did he treat all of you, you kids? Very well. He wasn't too good at the fathering stuff at first, but then he got better. He tried real hard. He was very interested in our school, always helping us with our homework, talking to our teachers. Were you or Tommy or Grant or Debbie ever afraid of your father? No. How do you think he felt about you overall? He loved us. I know that. We all know that. Kate, I'm going to play a tape. It is your mother having a conversation with your brother, Grant. You've listened to this tape, correct? Yes. And did you recognize it as a taped conversation on your father's answering machine? Yes. What a child, Cordan. Now, what is it about the bitch that turns you on? It's certainly not her intellect. She's a moron. She's a, an oversexed, syphilitic piece of poor white trash. You with the slut now, Dan? Probably, huh? Mommy, it's me, Grant. Hi, Grant. Hi, sweetheart. How's my baby boy? Are, are they treating you all right? Yeah, Mom, but... Because if they're not, you can come live with me. Wouldn't that be fun? Yeah, Mom, but you've got to stop leaving messages like this all the time. It, it makes me feel funny when you say all that stuff about mommy and daddy. Like, embarrassing stuff. Sweetheart, there's worse things in life than being embarrassed. I didn't cause this, your daddy did. But, Mom, all you care about is your stupid money and getting rid of Linda. You're always mad and everything. You never say anything nice anymore. Nice? Who's not nice? Your father, that's who. Your father dumped your mommy for a 12-year-old. That's nice? You little traitor. Who put you up to this? The slut or the pervert? Tell me, Grant. Tell your mommy. Grant, t talk to me. Please talk to me. Do you remember testifying at the first trial that you thought your mother was crazy when she told you your dad was having an affair with Linda? I don't think I said that mom was crazy, but I didn't believe that there was one. You talked about it with your father, though, didn't you? 
About him having an affair with Linda? Yes, before your parents separated. No, I did not. Really? Well, do you remember my asking you if Linda's name was brought up? No, I don't remember. Right. Would you please read pages 339 through 340, line 26 through 1. Does it not say, and I quote, you and I had an earlier conversation in which you indicated to me that you thought your mother was a little bit crazy because she talked about an affair with Linda. Yes, that's what it says. So, now do you remember? Well, I see it now, but I don't remember it. You don't remember? I don't remember being asked that in particular, but... You do remember testifying at the first trial, don't you? Don't you? Yes, Mr. Early. I've done a lot of things between then and now, and I don't remember exactly everything that I said. Well, I assume that at that time you were being as truthful as you could, weren't you? I'm trying to be truthful now, Mr. Early. I'm trying. I'm trying. Dr. Kurtz, could you tell us what you found with regard to the defendant's mental state? I found a great deal of evidence consistent with opinions that others had reached that Mrs. Broderick is not mentally ill, but rather she suffers from a personality disorder specifically a narcissistic personality disorder. Can you tell us how a psychiatrist would determine whether somebody has such a disorder? Actually, there are nine characteristics, but we diagnose people as narcissistic if they have five of those nine. What did you find regarding Mrs. Broderick? I found evidence of all nine. For instance, well, the first criterion is narcissistic rage in response to criticism. Examples in Mrs. Broderick's past include throwing things at Dan, locking him out of the house, burning his clothes, bashing her truck into his front door, her repeated homicidal threats. All this reflects a narcissistic rage of someone who perceives severe criticism of herself. What is the second criterion? That would come under the heading of interpersonal exploitation. That means, for example, the way she manipulated her children in her quest for revenge. She used them as pawns against Dan without thinking about how this would affect the children themselves. All this is corroborated in statements the children gave to therapists and the telephone tapes. Mrs. Broderick is an intelligent woman who even acknowledged reading books on divorce about the effects of this kind of behavior on children. But it was more important to her to hurt Dan and Linda than to prevent the possibility of harm to her children. Does your review of all the materials in the defendant's case file show her to be suicidal? It does not. In many ways, Mrs. Broderick is too narcissistic to kill herself. Narcissists have difficulty harming themselves because they hold themselves in such high regard. All her repeated threats were threats of homicide, not suicide. Not suicide, homicide. Thank you. Clemente! What? Take me to the infirmary. You sick? No, I'm not sick. I gotta testify tomorrow. Gotta do my roots. No, sorry. Infirmary's for illness. It's not a beauty parlor. Hey, hey, Captain knows about this. Hey! Hey, come back here, you Nazi! Come on. Let's talk about custody. I never got any. Right. 
Didn't you tell your psychiatrist, Dr. Farrelson, that you did not want your children until you were assured of your social standing? Exactly. Right. I, I had no security. I was too nervous to take them on with nothing. And I had nothing, nothing at all. You had been living in a $650,000 house for 16 months, correct? Yes. You had three cars? Maybe. But you wouldn't seriously discuss custody, would you? Dan wouldn't let me. He held out to the end. Right, the famous letter. Objection, Your Honor. Argumentative. Sustained. You testified that the last letter Dan sent you on November 3rd was the one that drove you over the edge and led to the events on November 5th, correct? Absolutely. It was another threat, another insult, another reference to my mental illness. Your Honor, I would submit this enlargement of that letter as People's Exhibit 278. Submitted. In fact, the letter is not from Dan to you, but from his lawyer to your lawyer. Same thing. <laughs> not really. In fact, Dan had offered you custody of the boys just the week before. This letter was simply a response to the latest barrage of obscene phone messages, was it not? I was very upset. I was defeated. The only weapon I had was my mouth. All this letter actually is, as you can see, is an admonition, a plea, really, to your lawyer to get you to stop the obscenities and to get on with the custody deal. Is this what you are telling us drove you over the edge? It was another warning. It was all in his hands. OK. He drove you over the edge, so you decided to drive yourself over to his house. I decided to drive to the beach. I needed some air. But you didn't drive to the beach. You drove to Dan's house. In order to, you testified earlier, kill yourself in front of him. Yes. You had your gun. It was in my purse. You had Kate's keys. I didn't know they were Kate's. So you picked up the keys, took the gun out of the purse, and snuck into his house. In order, you have said, to confront him to talk to him. Your word was confront. And you didn't want him to hear you come in, right? I didn't want him calling the police before I got to talk to him. Why the gun? To make him listen. A show of force, correct? Yes. So this had nothing to do, then, with killing yourself. You stated you wanted to kill yourself. That's a very different thing. No, you s the reason I wanted the gun, I wanted to make him hear me out. And if he didn't, I was going to kill myself. So you went into the house, snuck up the stairs very quietly, and went into the bedroom. And then what happened? I don't really remember. Uh, someone moved. I heard a voice, and it was over, just like that. I couldn't see anything. It was dark. Well, this time you testified that Linda said, call the police. But last time you testified that you don't remember anybody saying anything. Which is it? I don't really. It was just an impression I had. The... It happened too fast to remember. You did see Dan and Linda on the bed, correct? I have no recollection of having seen them at all. Well, how do you know if Linda or Dan moved if you couldn't see them. That was an impression I had at the time. Well, you can't have an impression of something unless you saw it. You testified that Linda moved towards Dan and Dan moved towards the phone. Did you see that or not? That was my impression. Did it happen? It was a blur. OK. Why did you start shooting? I panicked. You brought the gun as a show of force to, to talk, uh, to make him talk to, to me. To make him listen. And yet you didn't use it to show force. You didn't use the gun to say, hold it, Buster. I want to talk to you. You just shot. I never had a chance. 
Uh, what do you mean you didn't have a chance? What happened so fast? It was all so fast. Obviously, it wasn't. It took five shots for you to shoot these people. It could not have happened just like that, as you have indicated. It did. It does not take that to shoot Linda in the chest. <laughs> then shoot Dan in the back. <laughs> then re-aim and shoot Linda in the back of her head. <laughs> it could not. I, I didn't aim. I My finger tensed once. Did you voluntarily pull the trigger? I don't remember pulling it. Did you tell Dr. Groza, another psychiatrist of yours, that you remember pulling the trigger? I don't remember telling her because I don't remember pulling it. Would it refresh your memory to take a look at her notes? It says, I remember pulling it once. But I didn't see them. It, it was dark. You testified that after you shot Dan and Linda, you pulled the phone out of the wall because you were afraid that he might be alive and that he might call the police. Is that a fair and accurate portrayal? Yes, he, he scared me. Did I was you afraid... tell Dr. Farrelson that after you shot Dan and as he was reaching for the phone, you took the gun and deliberately smashed his hand on the night table? I don't remember saying that. Did you smash his hand with the gun? No. Then why did you tell your psychiatrist that you did? Object. Highly argumentative. Overruled. This is Cross. She may answer. Why did you tell Dr. Farrelson that after you shot them three times, you smashed Dan's hand with the gun as he reached for the phone? I don't remember. Do you remember telling Amy Wallace from the LA Times that there was no pain? There was no blood. It was simple. I had been told that, had heard it, it here in this courtroom during the first trial. Really? You made that statement back in March of 1990. The first trial began the following October. Do you remember saying in the same interview, I had only one choice, his funeral or mine? I said that, but I didn't. Did you say that? Did you make that statement? I had only one choice, his funeral or mine. Yes. And that is exactly what you did. You chose to make real sure that it was his funeral, correct? I didn't choose to. I went there to kill myself. Why didn't you? There weren't any bullets left. No, there weren't, were there? They had all been fired into the sleeping bodies of Dan and Linda Broderick. No pain and no blood. Not exactly true, Mrs. Broderick. Although, how would you know? You didn't stick around long enough to see the blood drain from their corpses. Did you? I understand the jury's reached the verdict. Will the foreman pass the forms to my bailiff, please? The clerk will read the verdicts. In the Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of San Diego, we, the jury, find the defendant, Elizabeth Ann Broderick, guilty of the crime of murder in the second degree. Victim, Daniel Broderick. We further find the defendant guilty of the crime of murder in the second degree. Victim, Linda Broderick. Sentence will be imposed at a later date. This court is adjourned.
Your Honor, uh, this is called an impact statement, so I will try to describe to you the impact Linda's murder has had on her family. We are all very close. My father does not even have the emotional fortitude to be here. He simply could not bear to be in the same room with the murderer of his youngest child. Our families have been compelled to talk to the media because the defense strategy has been to paint Dan and Linda as villains. We are put in the position of defending them. They are the ones who were murdered, and they have been put on trial. I'm baffled by it. I wanted to grow old with my sister. I wanted to be an aunt to her children. I wanted to spend a lot more time with her. But she's dead. No sentence could ever be proportionate with what was taken from Linda and what we have lost. Thank you. As it is within my discretion to do so, I'm imposing consecutive rather than concurrent terms for the maximum sentence of 15 years to life imprisonment for each crime of second degree murder. Jack, what are they doing? Elizabeth Broderick is currently incarcerated at the Central California Women's Facility at Chowchilla. She will not be eligible for parole until March 2011.